I want the living wage or I want even more. And I think universities just need to prioritize this as a way to alleviate the mental health crisis. Adri Corti. The goal of my channel is to make academia entertaining and accessible for you. If that sounds good, please make sure to go ahead and subscribe. So today is part two and the final part of my video series about mental health, specifically in graduate school. In part one, which you definitely want to go check out here, I talked about what's being called the mental health crisis in graduate students. And I talked about some of the reasons why this crisis exists and some of the interventions that were mentioned within the literature. Now, at the end of that video, I talked about how one of the main interventions, in my opinion, uh, was sort of missing from a lot of the literature I looked at. And this intervention for mental health is paying us better, paying us a living wage, paying us above the living wage. Please, sir, I want some more. What? 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 For more? So today, that's going to be the main thing I'm talking about how paying is better is probably the most effective intervention for graduate students' mental health to improve. So before I get into sort of the whole video, I just want you to know right now there's a trigger warning. Uh, I'm gonna be talking about suicide. So if that is not something you are comfortable with, please go ahead and just skip this video. There's an article I've mentioned in videos before. It's called Suicides at Vanderbilt Highlight Demand for Mental Health Services. And so this was published in February of this year. The main point of the article is highlighting that Vanderbilt has basically lost four doctoral students in the last two years to suicide. So this is a giant problem. I mean, one is too much, but four is just <laughs> is way too much. And that's what this article is sort of talking about. And so Vanderbilt basically, in response, put out a statement that said, it is committed to a culture of caring in which the well-being of all community members are extraordinary students, the faculty who teach them, and the staff who play an immeasurable role in the success of the university is enhanced and supported. And that they strive to foster a culture of openness through brave dialogue and honest self-reflection by investing in the mental health and wholeness of every member of the Vanderbilt family. They also sent out an email. The email was entitled Community Wellbeing. And they're basically talking about what Vanderbilt has done, you know, sort of in response to this horrible mental health problem that they've hired more counselors. They created student focus groups to address counseling concerns. They hired DEI faculty, started incorporating wellness and DEI topics into the first year curriculum and began examining graduate programs to identify steps that will promote wellness and relieve graduate student stress. Also in the email, they mention they are making increasing stipends to ease student financial pressure a priority. So I did appreciate this because they're actually naming that increasing our wages is a priority to improve our mental health. Like, I appreciate them saying that. But then sort of the next question was how? Like, how are you prioritizing this? So you should go check out my interview with the Vanderbilt Graduate Workers United, who talked about how during COVID, the Grad Workers United um, created this petition because we were not given the raises that we were supposed to get during a pandemic. They basically had to petition and they did end up winning the a raise for biomedical students. I'm bringing this up because it seems like if Vanderbilt was prioritizing increasing our stipends, this should not have to be done after students petition to still get raises. That's not making us a priority. That's responding to our anger and then giving us the raise. You know, graduate students shouldn't have to fight to get the wages that they were promised. The university should be increasing our pay. You know, as inflation is going up, like all of these things are happening, we shouldn't have to be fighting to increase our wages. So basically that's what's happening at Vanderbilt. The next question is, is there really actually a problem with how graduate students are being paid? You know, are we just exaggerating? Don't be so dramatic, darling. So I'm gonna show you today that we are actually not exaggerating. Here's an article called PhD students face cash crisis with wages that don't cover living costs. This article was published pretty recently in May. And so basically the, the main thing they say is that salaries for PhD students in the biological sciences fall well below the basic cost of living at almost every institution and department in the United States. 
according to data collected by these two PhD students. That just 2% of the 178 institutions and departments in the data set guaranteed graduate students salaries that exceed the cost of living. Okay, so that's a pretty tiny number. And they're calculating this cost of living using the MIT living wage calculator, which I'll link down below. And so this takes into account uh, the cost of like food, housing, transport, all the things that people spend their money on, and then tells you what the living wage in that city actually is. So the first thing I want to say about this article is that they're talking specifically about biological science students. And so I think that this probably is not great. Like we are some of the highest paid, you know, still underpaid, don't get me wrong, at most universities, but still some of the highest paid PhDs when you look at all the different like things you can get your PhD in, like the humanities. Like why would you take the highest paid people to show this issue? <laughs> to like illustrate how bad this problem is, you should take the people that get paid the least to illustrate this problem. So I thought that was sort of a weakness, but they're just specifically talking about biological sciences students. Another thing is that they, in the article there like there are some outliers like at Brown University the annual stipend for the PhD exceeds $42,000 and the cost of living there is only $36,000 so it's exceeding it by thousands which is amazing and then the thing that sort of annoyed me about this article again is that like other institutions pay the living wage or close to it and then name out all these universities and so I thought that was annoying because I don't think that you should be saying Universities that actually pay the living wage and universities that are close to it are in the same list. Like, a university should not be proud that they're close to paying people the living wage. That's still not the living wage. <laughs> like, close is not good enough. We were so close! Um, anyway, so they have this chart called where US biology PhD students can and can't get by. Blue is the cost of living with one adult, no children. And then orange is the guaranteed minimum salary that the university pays the PhD students. Places like Brown University here are actually exceeding um, the living wage and paying their students thousands of dollars more. I'll also link this article here called Brown University Graduate Workers Win Union Contract and First for Ivy League, which was published in 2020. The university that's paying their students the most on this list, their students also successfully unionized. So I think we should keep that in mind that that's probably why they're being paid such high wages versus other universities that have not yet successfully unionized. Um, so again, this seems probably due to like a student led effort rather than the university just being really generous. And so we'll talk a little bit about what the situation at Vanderbilt is. So in the article, again, they say Vanderbilt plays close to the living wage. So the living wage in Nashville for one adult with zero children is $35,312 before any taxes are taken out. So I wanted to look at someone from like the Department of English because again, biology students are like the highest paid PhD students on campus. Someone in the Department of English is being paid like $31,500, which is $4,000 dollars less than the living wage so they would be more like right here in the chart not great and so I wanted to think too about how much that is a month if you're in the let's say biology PhD student you're getting paid like two thousand nine hundred forty two dollars per month if you're a PhD student in the English department you're getting paid like two thousand six hundred twenty five dollars per month so that's a difference of $317. That is a lot of money. If we think about what it would mean to have $300 less every month or $300 more, like that could be the difference between getting healthier foods versus foods that are cheaper and probably worse for you. That could be the difference between being able to pay your student loans and not being able to pay your student loans. That could be the difference between being able to go to a doctor that isn't covered by your insurance versus not being able to go, being able to go visit your family if you don't live in the same city, especially if you don't live in the same country, just being able to go on vacation because we also deserve vacations, you know, being able to fill up your car with gas, and also just being able to save money. The difference between $300 a month could be someone is either able to save every month or not able to save. And again, I'm just using Vanderbilt as an example that even at Vanderbilt, when in this article they're saying the PhDs are pretty close to the living wage, that that's the highest paid PhDs. The others who in the humanities or in the English department are still way below the living wage. They aren't able to do the things they should be able to do with how hard they work and how much they produce for the university. And so yes, PhD students on average, most of the time are being paid less than a living wage. 
I've told you so far, you know, there's this mental health crisis within, among graduate students. Some universities are talking about how increasing stipends could help. I've showed you that we actually do get paid less than living wage a lot of the time. So sort of the next question is, is there a relationship between being paid badly, being poor, and bad mental health. We need to make that connection too to argue that actually paying us more is better for our mental health. Part one, I talked about the paper that's called Grad Students Are Having a Mental Health Crisis. And they have this, that study I talked about with thousands of graduate students where they measured depression and anxiety among graduate students. And they correlated the anxiety and depression with things like your gender identity, your relationship with your PI, and your mental health balance. You can look in the supplementary of the paper. They have a list of all the schools that the graduate students that were represented in the study were from. And so I think what would have been so cool and what could be so cool if someone does this is if you can basically take that list and and where they have now all these lists of schools and how much the graduate students are experiencing anxiety and depression and then correlate that with if the PhD students at the university are actually being paid a living wage because I think those results would be really interesting and would be convincing data to show universities that actually paying us more is an intervention to make our mental health better. Again the question though is does better pay correlate with better mental health? So I found this article called how to improve mental health in America raise the minimum wage and the person who wrote this article mentioned all these different papers that showed a correlation between like low income and having mental health issues. One of the papers they talk about shows a strong association between being low income and experiencing suicidal ideation or suicide attempts and substance abuse. They also talk about this thing called the Oregon Health Insurance Experiment, which after I tell you, you'll probably think it's as unethical as I think it is, but in this study, there were these uninsured Portland residents um, and they were able to enter into a, lo a lottery and then the winners of the lottery would be able to get insurance through Medicaid. America is just God. <laughs> Being able to get Medicaid for those people would reduce their out-of-pocket costs for the healthcare they needed. You get to decrease how much you're paying out of your own pocket for your medical care. And you don't have to live in such fear that you have a medical emergency and it will make you go broke. They now have these group of people that are getting Medicaid and these group of people that aren't. So now they can measure the, their mental health. They show that not surprisingly, the people who were able to get Medicaid, it reduced their financial strain. They also reported improved mental health and they were less likely to identify as depressed and it's just sad like in the United States that we have like these sort of lotteries where some people can get health care and then others can but I think this study was probably done as a way to show policymakers that providing health care um, would help people's mental health so hopefully the findings can be used for good and so then there was this other article called How Raising the Minimum Wage Can Be a Win for Mental Health. They had this article published in 2020 that showed that if the U.S. minimum wage was increased by just $1, there is a 3.4 to 5.9% decrease in the suicide rate among adults age 18 to 64 years. And so they're showing even a $1 increase could significantly decrease um, suicide rates in this population of people. Another article found that money problems are a significant risk factor for suicide, that in fact financial stressors like debt, unemployment, low income, and being a homeless person in the past can make someone 20 times more likely to attempt suicide. Another study found that households that had an income below $20,000 were much more likely to have mental health conditions such as depression and anxiety compared with those that are making $70,000 or more. So I think we're obviously seeing from from a lot of these papers and from just our lived experience that these financial stressors are of course making our mental health worse. That if you're paid better, you have more income so that you can live your best life and be able to have shelter and good food and go to the doctor and go to the dentist and the eye doctor and have all of these things that enrich your life and make you healthier, then of course this is going to correlate with better mental health. A lot of these studies have shown and a lot of literature shows that paying people more and taking them above their city's living wage is an effective way to improve people's mental health. What I really wanna talk about next and end on, when I showed you that paper um, that was showing how many biology PhD students are being paid under the living wage, the x-axis goes from $0 to $50,000. That's as far as it goes. This is based, again, like I said before, on if you're one adult living with zero children. 
So I was really curious. I was like, well, what if you even have one child? Like, how does this change? If you even have one child, the living wage before taxes now becomes $62,367. That is crazy. To try to incorporate graduate students even having one child, you would have to draw a brand new axis to even get what was supposed to be paid onto this graph. And so for something like Vanderbilt, if this was $62,000, we are unable to afford having just one child. We have to be paid almost double if we're going to even have one child in grad school to still be paid a living wage. So I just wanna bring this up because of what's happening in the United States right now where the Supreme Court just overturned Roe v. Wade. I think it's relevant to show that even if we have one child, all of us PhDs cannot afford it. And so so if we don't have access to that care, to abortions, then we are all being paid under living wage. Um, we cannot afford that child. How does someone survive that? And so I just want to say this tweet from this guy named Scott Hadland, who is a doctor. Um, he says, pediatrician here, this isn't about babies, because if it were, we'd support kids and families with health care, high quality education, universal child care, reliable housing, access to healthy food. This is about controlling women's bodies. That's basically sums up everything I feel about the situation. And I'll put down below uh, abortionfunds.org so you can start giving money to help alleviate this horrible thing that has now been placed on people that are able to get pregnant. I think universities need to treat being paid below a living wage as one of the main causes of bad mental health among graduate students. Yes, we should keep investing in these mental health resources for students like counselors. Like a lot of the things Vanderbilt said they're doing, they're incorporating these mental health workshops into the first year curriculum. You know, they're trying, but I think the number one thing is to pay us a living wage. You know, I want to say pay us more than a living wage. You know, the living wage is the bare minimum. <laughs> Pay us more than that. We produce a lot for universities. Most of the research coming out of universities is done by graduate students. A lot of these important findings are found by graduate students. We produce a lot and we should be paid more than living wage. You know, overpay us. We should be able to go on vacation. Why can't we buy a boat? I'm on a boat. I'm on a boat. I want the living wage or I want even more. And I think universities just need to prioritize this as a way to alleviate the mental health crisis. And I think too, the conversation about Roe v. Wade now, that universities need to stay on top of these issues on our rights being taken away, provide us funds to go get abortions, no questions asked, that they provide us resources so we can still go get access to healthcare that is important for our mental health, important for our bodily autonomy, <laughs> important for all of these things. So I think universities need to keep this in mind. We have to keep fighting, keep giving money to these abortion funds, keep supporting each other. Stay tuned for the next video. I'm not sure what it will be yet, but thank you for watching. I hope you get paid more. I hope you have access to life-saving healthcare. Uh, we all gotta stick together. So subscribe if you enjoyed this video and I will see you guys next time.